Okay, so the area of predictive maintenance, um, we were saving about $100 million a year. We reduced our maintenance fees, not just with infrared, but with some of those other technologies. We were up around $6.1 billion a year. We dropped it a whole billion dollars in 10 years, utilizing infrared, vibration analysis, um, electric motor diagnostics. We shaved a billion dollars out of that maintenance fee. So this really, and the biggest cost saver was, was infrared. We came in and kicked butt on all the other technologies. It's so ubiquitous, it just works everywhere. Mechanical systems, electrical systems, number one of all of these is electrical. Energy and steam, just general stuff, roofs, leaking roofs. Most of our plants had plastic spread around here and there with drips coming through every time it rains. So looking at roof insulation, in process, in-plant process operations, and then buying off of new process equipment. This alone would pay off any program that you want to get into in your corporation. All right, electrical. Certainly here's a gentleman with an old Agema looking at a few hundred connections here very quickly. Prime example might be a fuse block like this, looking at the connections. Now we can't measure the metal because of the high reflectivity of that, but we go just off the metal and look at our plastic or on the cardboard on the fuses. And we see things like this. It's hot, but it, 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 if it was highly reflective, it would have looked like this, but we see it, the heat going over onto the fuse block, we can see that immediately and we know there's something going on with that, co that connection. It's corroded or it loses its spring cons constant and it, it's a loose connection. Go in and clean it. In a lot of cases, you don't have to shut down your process. Um, this alone is just millions of dollars, cost savings a year, uh, all the loose connections. Some of our cases, we had to send electricians into our connectors once or twice a year and torque every wire screw to make sure without infrared, they didn't know what was loose. Retorque them because they cut loose. Turning on, turning off, carrying current, heat cycles, those connections got loose. Bus ducts carrying 1200 amps. When you get to a corner and you turn on your, your body shop, turn off your body shop, turn on your machine shop, those heat up and they loosen. The right angles like to loosen up more than anything else, you'll get a hot spot and that thing won't repair itself. It's gonna start getting hotter and hotter. I've seen it where it's melted copper at 1,098 Celsius. BBs of copper coming out of those bus ducts. And in some cases that has fallen down out of GM in another plant and caused fires on the plant floor, having 1,000 degree molten metal drip out of a bus duct. Typical bus duct finding in a body shop is a half million dollars, cost savings, immediately. You you find it, put a jumper on it, you don't miss a beat on your production. So uh, in the area of electrical, it's very, very, very cost of, uh, to your advantage to do it. And it, it could be a process. You know, we've looked at um, big machines doing certain and intricate processes to make a part right. Just walk around like a die cast machine or a, uh, a, a a molding machine and look at your connections, look at your motors. Uh, you'll see in a minute all of that and how it applies. Here's your bus duct, these are the corners. You know, and we're looking for 11 degree rise Fahrenheit and it's a thousand degrees behind that, that steel wall. Uh, there's an air gap there, you won't see the real temperature till you get up and open up the door and look at what's going on. But on the plant floor, 10 degrees Fahrenheit, you got a problem. Get up there right away. Bruce? Yeah, I would blow up with a 7 degree difference there. 7 degrees blow up. Like Dan said, you've got an air gap between the actual bus bars and the protective cladding around it. Yep. And if you're jumping that air gap, you can make a 7 degree temperature rise and say a 10 foot span there. You've got some tremendous temperatures behind that. Yep. The maintenance people went out and looked at the joint. All they did was torque them down a little bit. Instead of taking them apart to see how much pitting there was on the joint, so they told them they needed to take it apart. Uh, before they took it apart, they blew apart and lost the uh, oh. shipping dock and the main offices of the plant there. 
Wow. And fortunately, they flew it on Friday afternoon, so they managed to jump around before Monday morning. But they jump when they have to, too, but it's too bad. You know, you almost caught it in time. Uh, this was just a, a, a lucky find. We were walking from our assembly plant out to the powerhouse. And the guy said, he was a beginning guy, he said, let me just look over the fence and check the bushings from Detroit Edison, right? Well, sure enough, we, on the far bushings, uh, it was a fall day of October. 60 degrees, typical bushing. Here, almost double that here on these two bushings. We called in Detroit Edison, they came out with their little spot detector, said, we don't have a problem. We showed them the data, they said, you have a problem. So without shutting the plant down, they were able to put jumpers in, replace that bushing. It was there, they owned that problem. And uh, sure enough, we, we got it solved. I had a similar one. Uh, we have a supplier down in Mexico, uh, almost identical. I could see um, uh, heat going into the plant supply. I had the plant manager sitting this close to me. I showed him the data. He jumped up, shook my hand. We're going to jump right on it, Dan. Six months later, they brought me down to Mexico. The problem was still there. It was even hotter than what I was, and I, would, I wouldn't even go close to it, it was that hot. I said, you haven't repaired it. Oh, we're gonna get to it, Dan. Not, like three weeks later, the plant blew, that blew up, shut the whole plant down, cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars. They had to bring in tanker trucks, or flatbed trucks with big generators hooked to the plant power supply just to run the plant to make what they make for GM, Ford, Chrysler, everybody else. It was a major uh, magnetics plant down there. Just ignoring simple data like this. It doesn't repair itself, folks. Here's one. I was walking through the plant. It was one of our uh, plants making uh, certain parts, and uh, I saw a pattern like this. I said, my goodness, that looks like that's a bad spindle. I look at the halo around it. This was a painted uh, boring machine, spindle machining head. I called the operator. Oh yeah, it's making bad parts on that one. I, went, I can see why. So uh, that had a bad bearing in it. We had to stop that and get it repaired. But um, very simple data. Not much interpretation needed to see that that spindle was trying to tell us that it had a problem. Okay, simple. This is another trick that I do when I show data. First of all, anytime you see couplings between a motor and a driven machine, like a pump or a gearbox, anytime you see heat in the coupling, you have misalignment. No doubt about it, we've got studies on this. Any coupling with heat in it is misaligned. If you have misalignment, you're wasting energy. You're gonna blow the axles crack them or blow the bearings on either the motor or the pump, or all three are gonna go bad. You're, you're fooling yourself. So when you take an image like that, show one if you can, that's perfect. Look at this, this is running full blast, no heat in the bearing. This one's aligned properly. This one, call out your alignment crew, get them on this right away before the thing takes on that operation. Okay, and then showing two things at once is a great way to not have any arguments. Otherwise, if you just show this, you're going to have the supervisor go, it'll run another three weeks, you know. It'll be fine. You show a comparison like that, they'll jump on it. They, they go, oh my gosh, you're right. You know, there's just no argument. So I do that with fuse blocks, with couplings. Anytime you can, show the comparison in the same thermogram. If you have, even if you have to bring two thermograms into the same image when you're doing your report, do that, okay? So the folks can understand it and you don't have to say one word. Here's another typical, this is down in Mexico at this magnetics plant. You know, this, they're both pumps are running full blast. Guess which one had the bad bearing? And they wanted to clean up all these things before, the, uh, before I left, so. This thing was so hot, it was still, it was warming the water it was pumping. Look at the heat going up here compared to this. So they're both running fine. One's got a bad bearing. Here's an overhead trolley looking at wheels that need uh, lubricant. This is just a simple application. Well-greased wheels run cool. 
And we're not looking, this is five degrees Fahrenheit over background. Subtle temperatures are trying to tell us something. That, that guy's gonna fall apart. It may not be this week, it might be next month. If that falls apart, it's gonna drop something, or it's gonna shut that thing down, or it's gonna jam. We can see that 50 feet away with infrared imaging and fix it. Get some lubricant in it, still stays warm, repair it. We got miles and miles of this in every plant. Just miles of conveyor. And, uh, and it could be a bakery, it doesn't have to be automotive, it could be uh, any place that needs conveyors, you know, cool down stuff, or to carry things around. Here was a backup uh, air compressor for one of our plants. Let's take a look at it. No, you don't want to turn it on. I said turn it on and we'll watch the heat up of it and see if it's okay. So here's a backup. We turned it on and sure enough, water flow was fine on this side. Thing never heated up, but they had blocked water flow. This backup air compressor would have failed in hours. So here's the plant relying on something. Let's do it, let's put it on our route and let's check it, make sure it will run. We can do that on fire pumps that they have to check every so often. We can do it on backup air compressors. We can do it on many, many things. And you don't need a lot of uh, training to look at this. That's all painted. Nothing here to worry about emissivity and, and it's pretty intuitive. Body shops. Body shops, we have up to 900 robots in, in a typical body shop. Typical car, 5,000 spot welds. These guys are cooking and using electricity like crazy. Some of these uh, kickless cables will carry 20,000 amps to make that weld. These things, when they break down or get pinched off or too much exercise or they're not held right, they break down. If they break down, if they block their water, guess what? Carrying 20,000 amps, they explode. We did some uh, financial calculations. If we use infrared in every body shop and look for problems like this, well, like this, we can save $3 million per body shop per year just looking at kickless cables. No other application. So here I got $3 million cost savings, one application, one thermal imager, looking at kickless cables. So add to that now, with everything else you've seen today, it, it can add up pretty darn quick. So our limit was about 150 Fahrenheit. Uh, the breakdown, we see barber polling like this. 150, you've got to get that changed out right away. That's going to explode. It can go anytime. This one still has some life to it. But, uh, uh, it's that simple to look at. It's a rubber um, covered cable, very good emitter. Uh, just no question about it. So infrared pays. Um, uh, you've seen everything, process control, buying off equipment, predictive maintenance, uh, doing thermal wave imaging in the, in the body shop or in the, in the uh, putting the panels together. Uh, well, there's no question. So obstacles, certainly. It's not easy. It hasn't been about better roses. My main obstacle has been middle management. I just won't. I get Roger Smith come through, Dan, that's great. I get uh, Rutger, uh, one of our VPs come through, just terrific. Show this to so-and-so, this is great. I go to a middle management, oh, we can't do it. It's, it's not in the budget. I really don't believe that we're gonna get that kind of cost saving. Forget about it. I've told this story. Hundreds and hundreds of times, these guys won't spend the money. That's who your obstacle's gonna be. You gotta buy them a beer, show them good data, become friends, establish a relationship with them, get them on your side. Tough, tough guys. You know, especially those older guys that have been around managing and, yep, they, uh, they know, I mean, they're, the backbone in many cases of our plants, but they don't want something new coming down their block that they don't understand. So they're gonna say no. Lack of manpower has been a problem. We find a lot of problems, but not enough manpower to repair. Keep on the edge of that, those repairs. Uh, and what, what's the worst thing to do is when our guys find a problem and not fix it. 
Talk about a message we're giving our, our workers. We give them infrared, go out and find a problem. Oh, we're not going to fix that yet. You know, that's not what you want to tell them. Man. I had a gentleman down in Spring Hill, Tennessee, uh, where we built the Saturns, and uh, Mike Hensley. He, would find, he was a great thermographer, and um, we asked him to write a report once and present it at one of our maintenance symposiums. In his report, he was a real bashful guy. It took a lot to get him to write that and talk in front of all the people, right? He says very quietly, I saved about, I, I didn't want to put any money on this, but I saved about 78 hours of production. I went, 78 hours? I'm doing the back of the envelope calculation. My God, that's like $40 million. In saleable vehicles, this guy would do his repairs on lunch breaks and uh, late, uh, breaks during the day. He'd know what he found, go and repair them all. They're all pretty much pretty simple. And he would add 10 minutes here, five minutes there. At the end, 78 hours he'd saved of, of actual downtime of the production line. And he didn't want to tell anybody, you know? Unbelievable cost saving. If I was plant manager, he would have had a new car in that driveway of his. No questions asked. The guy was a, a hero, but un, unspoken hero. So manpower is really critical. High price used to be a problem. It's really dropped significantly. Uh, and much to everybody that's into it, uh, it's a great thing now to be able to say this is only 9,000 instead of 40,000. This is only $1,500 instead of 12,000. Machine vision tools are falling. Everything's coming down because of the, uh, the foundries making infrared sensors are up and running. The military's been buying a lot. There's a lot out there now, and they're building a lot of uh, infrared cameras. So the prices are dropping. A lot of people are getting into it. So the price is coming down. Cost of training is a real headache still. Uh, my little two take two for safety is pushing training, pushing the certification, but you have to budget for it. And having a large turnover of manpower is just killing folks in trying to get training money. Somehow, I don't have the answer yet on how to do that. Um, if, if anybody has any answers, I'd be certainly willing to dis open up a discussion on that. But you have to budget for it. If you don't, you're, you're shooting yourself in the foot. And it's just an, an unfortunate thing. You've got to have well-trained folks out there to know what they're seeing when they look at infrared. And then again, not keeping up with your repairs. That just is the wrong message for your plant for the people doing the work and uh, plant